On December 21st, 1937, Disney released the world's first full-length animated feature film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And, and this was a huge smile, uh, milestone, not just for Disney, but for movie making in general. It is said that in 1934, when Walt Disney first told his animators about this idea he had, they were taken aback by the thought. Uh, even though they had made many short films, they were now talking about drawing an 80-minute film into life, something that no other studio had even attempted before. Now, as exciting as this project was, the rest of Hollywood uh, film industry remained skeptical that Walt Disney could actually pull this off. In fact, uh, this endeavor was described as Disney's folly because of how risky it was. So risky that if this movie failed, not only would the whole studio go bankrupt, Walt would have even lost his home. And perhaps the scariest thing of creating this film is that most people in Hollywood were convinced that nobody would ever sit through such a film. In the end, Snow White required the work of 750 artists, 32 animators, 25 background artists, and 102 assistants to create the thousands of drawings used to make this movie. This project took three years to make and had a budget of about $1.5 million. But on December 21st, 1937, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves held its premiere at the Kathy Circle Theater in Los Angeles and instantly made history. To this day, Snow White remains the most profitable film of all time. In fact, Snow White has a lifetime gross of $418 million across its original release and several other reissues, including books, video games, theme parks, a Broadway musical, comic strip adaptations, and even a prequel that was ultimately canceled. And when you adjust those numbers for inflation, Snow White still remains one of the top 10 American film moneymakers of all time. This animated film was worth every penny it took to create. So after doing all this research on this movie, I decided that I needed to go back and watch it again. Now, it, wasn't, um, it doesn't have the coolest effects, right? the coolest sound effects or light effects, the mouths of the characters don't always move accurately with the voiceover, and, and some scenes are just lived out by putting words on the screen, telling you what happened next. But when you take into account when it was created and the fact that something like this had never been done before, it's an overall very impressive movie. Except that I have one problem with it. At the end of the movie, Snow White and the Prince head off into the sunset towards their castle, and then the words appear on the screen, and they lived happily ever after. You've heard that phrase before, right? They lived happily ever after. As I read those words, my immediate thought was, did they really? I mean, think about this. The only family Snow White has are the seven dwarves and the animals that she's made friends with, right? She has to leave behind her family. On top of that, according to the movie at least, Snow White and the prince never really have a conversation on screen, right? They, they, at no point do they actually talk. And so she has to leave everything behind to go live with Prince Charming, a guy who she's never even had a conversation with. I'll be honest with you. There have been many times in my life when I meet someone and I think to myself, I really want to be friends with them. But once we start having a conversation, I realize I don't have anything in common with them and I really don't want to spend much more time with them. So call me cynical, but as I read the words, and they lived happily ever after, all I could think about was, I really hope it works out for her. Now, I don't know about you, but growing up, I had this idea that once I hit certain milestones, I would begin to live happily ever after. For a while, I thought happily ever after would begin after I graduated college. Then I thought happily ever after would begin um, whenever I got my first adult job. Then I thought maybe happily ever after will begin after marriage or after I buy a house or after having kids. But happily ever after, depending on how you understand it, hasn't really begun. Now, don't get me wrong. I am very happy. I love my life. I love my wife. I love my dog, my house, my job, my family. I love all of these things. And all of these things make me very happy. But none of them have created a life that is nothing but happiness ever after. Let me say that again. None of them have created a life for me that is nothing but happiness ever after. 
They give me glimpses of happiness, and they give me long moments of happiness, and, and they make me really happy. But I still deal with struggles and pain and sorrow, and I still have weeks where I'm down, and, and there's still things that hurt. See, I think that's because happiness takes work, not certain milestones. Let, let me explain what I mean by all this. In the book of Ezra, in our Bible, we learn of the story of the Israelites coming back from captivity and exile. Now, let me give you some history around that. Around 600 BC, Babylon conquered Israel and made the entire nation of Israel scatter across the known world in order to avoid any revolts. This, of course, only angered the people more, and conflict continued to take place between Babylon and the Israelites. As a result of these revolts, Babylon decided to destroy Jerusalem. Uh, this included the temple, to which, uh, which to this day continues to be a holy site for the Israelite people. Now, this was a huge blow for Israel. In their minds, they did not know how to exist uh, as a people separated from their land without a temple in which to worship their God. So when, when Babylon took over and they lost everything, they, they, were not, they definitely were not living there happily ever after. But in 539 BC, the Persian king Cyrus conquered Babylon. And in the book of Ezra, uh, we hear one of the first decrees that the king says, and this is what it says. Thus says King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord, God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of those among you who are his people, may their God be with them, are permitted to go up to, the, uh, to Jerusalem in Judah and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. So they're back in Jerusalem. They're rebuilding the temple. And from this point forward, they are supposed to live happily ever after with God, right? I mean, this was supposed to be the beginning of their happily ever after. They come back. They get their land. They get to rebuild their temple. Everything is going to be perfect. Except that it wasn't. Eventually, they did take control of their land. But their land would eventually be taken away from them by Rome and many other empires after that. You see, I think that the Israelites forgot that happily ever after, happily ever after doesn't come from having a temple or a city to call their own. And the same is true for Snow White. Happily ever after doesn't come from getting married and moving to some castle. Here's where happily ever after comes from. In Ezra chapter 6, they finally completed building the temple and it's been dedicated, and now they're going to celebrate the Passover at the temple. And, and Passover is a big deal, but that's a, a, for another sermon. But in Ezra chapter 6, verse 22, it says this. With joy they celebrated the festival of unleavened bread seven days, for the Lord had made them joyful and had turned, their heart of the king, had turned the heart of the king of Assyria to them, so that he aided them in the work on the house of God, the God of Israel. Did you catch it? The king's decision wasn't what brought them joy. The building of the temple wasn't what brought them joy either. Ezra says, for the Lord had made them joyful. For the Lord had made them joyful. You see, their happily ever after was not going to come from stuff or buildings or location or even wealth. Their joy, their happily ever after was going to come from God. See, what they missed was that God can make them joyful even without a temple, even without Jerusalem, even when they are scattered across the known world. God can bring them joy. God can bring them their happily ever after. Friends, if you're searching for your happily ever after, you will never find it in people, places, or things. Our happily ever after comes from God and God alone. You see, no matter what you're going through, what is missing in your life, or where you find yourself today, God wants you to experience joy in your life. So stop searching for joy in things, and instead, invite God to help you live happily ever after with Him, despite your circumstances. I told you earlier, I, I always thought having a wife, or having kids, or having a house, or having a truck would bring me my happily ever after. And what I missed all along was that God wanted me to live happily ever after despite those things. All of that 
is just the cherry on top of life. God wants us to live our happily ever after from him. And everything else is just extra joy that we get to experience. Friends, go live your happily ever after, close to God, and enjoy everything else on top. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, I give you thanks that you are a God who offers us joy beyond our wildest imagination. We thank you that you are a God who wants us to live out our happily ever after, close to you. And so God, I pray that in, in everything that we experience in this world and the places, the people, the things that bring us joy, God, may they just be uh, supplements of joy. May, may they just add joy to our life. But may our joy not be dependent on them. Because as long as we lean on you and rely on you, nothing can destroy our happily ever after. God, I give you thanks. And I pray this in your most precious and most glorious name. Amen. Well, friends, before we go, I want to encourage you to do one last thing. I want you to grab your cell phone and text the word uh, GROW, G-R-O-W, to the number 225-307-0662. That'll take you, uh, it'll give you a link to a home sheet, and it's just a one-page document that'll have the scriptures we read today. It'll have a couple of questions to think, to think about, and it'll have an action plan for how to live this sermon out this week. I really want, want to encourage you to, to download that and fill that out. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us, and remember... I love you, God loves you, and there's nothing you can do about it. I'll see you next week.